We are studying through James currently, and we are finding ourselves this morning landing in James chapter 2. So if you'll turn to James chapter 2 with me, and I've titled this morning's message, Putting Aside Partiality, Pulling In Some Truth That We Saw Last Week, um, Combined With Where James Is Headed, and That's The Way Biblical Interpretation Is Often Done, It's Done Within The Preview Of Context. And... Uh, Speaking of context, uh, by way of introduction, uh, this isn't the most um, glamorous introduction, I might say, but I want us to look back by way of introduction this morning to chapter 1, verse 21, to help give us a little bit of sitting, sitting uh, standing on uh, where James is heading as he gets to chapter 2. We saw this last week in chapter 121. It says, therefore, putting aside all filthiness. And so, again, I titled my message this morning, Putting Aside Partiality. And so I'm pulling the putting aside portion of that from right here in verse 21. We need to be those who are putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. Um, As mentioned last week, filthiness and what remains of wickedness would be um, poor, sinful behavior patterns that these brethren who have been dispersed abroad, see chapter 1, verse 1, are still living in. They've, they're struggling with their new circumstances, the trials, the various trials that they have faced in life. And James has said in verse 8 of chapter 1, if you're struggling with that, pray for wisdom. God will assist you. If you're double-minded, you're going to be unstable in all your ways. And he's reminding them here in 21 the need to be putting aside what remains of your continual habitual sins that are not conformative to being a follower of Jesus Christ. And so receive, he says, the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. And the word that James is implanting them, that God canonized for us, we've spent the last four or five weeks studying chapter 1. This is a word that when implanted in us, it will save us from a world of trouble because sin leads to death, and if we choose to walk in sin, we will experience death. So James is telling them now is the time to put such behavior aside. In other words, James is in essence saying, repent. He's calling these, these believers to repent of sin and to walk by faith instead. And you do that by receiving the word that's implanted, which is a word from the Greek. And notice right here, I, I throw this up here because in the um, Luonida lexicon, it's a Greek dictionary, notice its, um, its use is the same passage we're dealing with right here, which is James 1.21. And in giving a, a, rending a translation of this, notice right here, see after it says implanted, they've got in parentheses here the implied indication and meaning of this implanted. It's implanted within you. And so it's to be permanently in a place with the implication of development, and we would say development into Christ's likeness. God's word implanted within us is to bring about development within our character. It's to make us look more like Jesus. So it says, placed in, and I love this part right here, permanently established in. Uh, that's just a, a, a beautiful way of thinking about what it means to have God's word implanted. It's to be permanently established. The word of God is to be permanently established, a fixture of truth where? Within you. It's to be the rock upon which you stand. It's, it's to be the truth that guides your light. It's the light that leads you through the pathway. It's through the valleys of the shadow of death. Truth. It's permanently established in you. A solid conviction that God's word and his ways are true. Now, in our text this morning, and this is why I bring this up as an introduction, because James is going to deal specifically with a sin issue that these 
brethren need to be putting aside. And this was written some 2,000 years ago, and it's still as pertinent of a sin today as it has ever been. You remember the uh, Jews referred to the Gentiles as what? Dogs. There, there wasn't a lot of, of um, personal favoritism shown towards Gentile dogs. As a matter of fact, they were to be avoided at all cost. But Christ broke down the dividing wall, that barrier between. So there's, ne- there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither net male nor female. Christ has removed these social and cultural dividing walls that bring us together as one new man in Christ Jesus through the gospel in the church. And such truth is to be permanently established within us so that we are living rightly. And so James is going to be dealing with the sin of partiality, dealing with the sin of favoritism, of showing personal favoritism to those who can in turn perhaps provide an immediate benefit to your life in disregard to others who from your perspective perhaps don't have the ability or seemingly anything to offer you by way of value. We need not be showing partiality within the church of Jesus Christ. And it seems from the amount of time that James spends on dealing with this topic here in chapter 2, the the number of words that he uses uh, in in describing this, it must have been a very active Temptation towards sin in the lives of those who were dispersed when persecution broke out against the believers following Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And so it seems with the illustration that James uses in this context that there were some within the church gathered who were looking to gain favor with those who had the appearance of being able to profit them personally. Notice chapter 2 verse 1. He says, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. This translation is from the ESV, the English Standard Version, which I'm showing deference to over what I normally read from, which is the New American Standard, because it aligns itself so closely with the originals the original from the Greek. This is a really great translation. Show no partiality as. He's going to be showing that there's an incompatibility with holding the faith of Christ and having personal favoritism. That these things are, are incompatible. Show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious one, the Lord of glory. Partiality is from a word in the Greek that means to accept a face or to receive by the face. Think about that. To accept a face or to receive by the face. It's the idea of making unjust distinctions between people solely on external face values. What they look like. The clothing that they put on their back in this context, or the gold ring on their finger, or perhaps the color of their skin, etc., etc., we may go. To accept a face, judging by appearances only, and on that basis alone, giving preferential treatment to those with whom you more acutely are akin with. Has a lot been made to do recently about racism within our country by chance? Have you happened to, have you heard that anywhere at all? To accept by the face, at an appearance level only, making distinctions between people because you think that that individual perhaps can do something favorable for you or disfavorable for you, seems to be the context in which James is dealing with here. And it would seem to make sense, the illustration that he's about to make in verses 2 through 4, it seems to make sense in the use of the rich and the poor in this context, 
Because if you think about those who were dispersed, now your, your temptations for showing partiality may be different than was theirs, but these individuals who have been dispersed abroad probably have become day laborers on someone's farm somewhere as a way to make an income. They lost everything they had. So the temptation, the sin temptation to show favoritism towards those who might come into the church who appeared to be wealthy would be an obvious conclusion that they might fall prey to in that they were in need of finances, oftentimes. So the illustration isn't exclusively to just rich and poor. As you heard me just kind of articulate, it can also go to other ways of thinking about not showing partiality, that it's incompatible with Christianity, of not showing personal favoritism. But in the illustration that James uses, that's exactly where he goes. In some of my commentary reading, I, I lighted upon this quote from Henry Bosch from February the 2nd of 1979 out of Our Daily Bread. I just found it interesting. It says, Mahatma Gandhi was the leader of the Indian nationalist movement against British rule and is considered the father of his country, India. He is internationally esteemed for his doctrine of nonviolence to achieve political and social progress, or progress, depending on how you say that. He said in his autobiography that in his student days, he was truly interested in the Bible. Deeply touched by reading the Gospels, he seriously considered becoming a convert. Christianity seemed to offer the real solution to the caste system that was dividing the people of India. One Sunday, he went to a nearby church to attend services. He decided to see the minister and ask for instruction in the way of salvation and enlightenment on other doctrines, but when he entered the sanctuary, the ushers refused to give him a seat and suggested that he go and worship with his own people. He left and never came back. If Christians have caste differences also, he said to himself, I might as well remain a Hindu. To accept a face, the sin of partiality. And I submit to us this morning that our flesh, our flesh that remains, predisposes us to being prejudiced against truly needy people, people who don't look like we look, people of different color, people of different socioeconomical backgrounds, etc., etc. We could go. We are oftentimes predisposed in our flesh to being partial to people who are like us. Aren't we? Listen, the Bible lets us know there's nothing new under the sun. This is a sin that was happening here some 2,000 years ago. We could go back and we could read in the Old Testament. We could go some four or 5,000 years ago and discover that partiality, favoritism, culturalism, racism, whatever you, however you want to color that stripe, has been around because it's in our flesh. It's in our sin nature. Now, those who've come to faith in Christ, we no longer have a sin nature. The old is gone, the new has come. We, in the new covenant of Christ, we have a new nature in Christ Jesus, but we have flesh that remains, and so we are to be putting to death deeds of the flesh as we are sojourning here, awaiting our time when we are face to face with Christ. Amen? Listen, James' point is that faith in Christ and partiality are incompatible. And this is why he says, again, as straightforward as he can, show no partiality. Bob Newhart would just say, stop it. And if you know what I'm speaking of, you know the reference there. Stop it. Don't do it. And at the same time, be claiming to hold to faith in Christ, who is the glorious one, the Lord of glory. It is indeed incompatible to hold to the faith and at the same time make such distinctions. 
This is why I believe that James ended us in chapter 1 and verse 27, just simply saying that pure and undefiled religion is about helping the neediest of people, orphans and widows, people who probably aren't going to look a whole lot like us, people who have nothing to offer us, people who there's no quid pro quo kind of a concept happening here. We serve them, we minister to them, and we give out to them, and there's not going to be any kickbacks at all. There's nothing in return. That's pure and undefiled faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in verses 2 through 4, James is going to flesh this out, this principle, out with a vivid illustration that we've just briefly made mention of. Notice verses 2 through 4. He says, For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes. So here in verse 2, we see that those believers who have been dispersed abroad, chapter 1, verse 1, uh, seemingly have formed a local church. It's here referred to as an assembly. So when a man comes into your assembly dressed one way, or there comes another dressed a different way. So the, the assembly here seems to be talking about on any particular Lord's Day when the local church is gathered, when believers come together, and you have a visitor come into your assembly dressed either in fine clothing, wearing a gold ring, or dressed poorly, wearing dirty clothes... There's a need to not have face value. There's a need to not show partiality to said people. And verse 3, and if you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say you sit here in a good place and to the poor man you stand over there or sit down by my footstool, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with, and notice what it says. James, James isn't mincing words, is he? I mean, he's, he's not mincing words. He says, that kind of a thought pattern, those kinds of motives are evil in the sight of God. And thus, we need to be those who take it as seriously as evil motives need to be taken seriously. So at the end of this illustration, with the rhetorical question, there's only one possible answer, and that is, yes, we have made distinctions, and we have wrong and evil motives. Now, again, in this simple illustration that James uses, the contrast between these two people, these two men who come into the church, who come into the assembly on any given Lord's Day, couldn't be more obvious. There's a gold ring and fine clothes that indicates that this one individual is perhaps a wealthy individual, and he has something to, to give to the church, something to give to the community, and those who treat him well, perhaps have something to gain, and thus special attention was being given to this man, while the poor man, obviously with the dirty clothes, shabby clothing, as it says in the ESV, is asked to sit somewhere else and perhaps even out of sight. Again, the clear presumption being that this man, being poor, cannot be of benefit to this local church community. And so it, it breaks down that believers within this church, and James is going to make it a very pointed reality that this is what you are doing. You are making these kinds of distinctions and you are judging people and you have evil motives. Stop it. You need to stop it. I was thinking about this scenario of, of a wealthy man and a poor man and um, I, I, I couldn't think of, in the two and a half years that we've been here as a church, I can't think of one instance where I've ever witnessed anything like this at all. And so I want to commend you, Jinx Bible Church, for loving well. And I want to encourage you to continue doing the same. And I will say, at the same time, one of the things that I hear most often from people who join is that there is a genuine love they feel within this church, that people genuinely love them regardless of how they look, dress. And, and if you look around, we have, we have people of, of different stripes, don't we? I mean, I see some people that look like me, and I see some people that maybe don't look like me. I see some people that might have different interests than, that I might have, and it, it, and it shows in the apparel that they might wear, etc., etc. 
but I've heard nothing but affirming affirmations from, from everyone that I've talked to about this church, and so I want to affirm you on that. So I was thinking it's hard for me to find this kind of an example within a church context. Now, I, I know that there are those out there, as is the one that James is using. He's going to say in verse 6 that you're the man. You are guilty of doing this very thing. But it, it reminded me of one time when I was living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and um, I was given an opportunity while serving at the church to also be the chaplain for the Pittsburgh Pirates, which is the professional baseball team there in Pittsburgh. And so every other Sunday, they had a home game every other Sunday, and so every other Sunday, rather than going to church and ministering at church, the elders gave me permission to go to the ballpark. Hey, somebody's got to do it. Just, I mean, it, it was a tough gig, but I, I was suffering for Jesus, okay? So I had to go to the ballpark, and in, and in going to the ballpark, I had some special VIP privileges, right? I had these little badges, and I could get in, in underneath, and I... I actually got into the locker rooms, and I got to do three Bible studies every other Sunday, one to the home team, one to the visiting team, and one to the umpires. And they always told me, you're out. No, I'm just kidding. They... <laughs> I actually did have one of them who wouldn't, allow me to, wouldn't prohibit me entering into, their, into their, their room, their area. So he, he told me I was out. But, um, but in that, there was a, 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 one of the players for the Pirates. His name was Kevin Young, and he was one of their young studs at the time, first baseman, tall, black man, is extremely skilled in baseball, and had a very lucrative contract. And he and I met up for lunch one day, and I can't remember the name of the restaurant we went to, but let me tell you, the manager met us at the table. We walked in and were seated immediately. We, when they recognized that Kevin Young was coming, the line, there was no line. They, they sent not just someone, the manager came out and greeted us and allowed us to pat, bypass the line and gave us a favorable table within the, the establishment. And this, I've never even met this man before in my life, and he was treating me as if I were royalty. I kind of like personal favoritism. It felt really good. <laughs> and then at the end of the meal, we, we didn't even have to pay. I'm telling you, the rich get richer. He didn't even have to pay for his $25 ticket that was supposed to come to the table. We were treated extremely well. And to be quite honest with you, I liked it. There was something in my flesh that was like, yeah, I could get used to that. Have you ever experienced that? And we have to what? We have to put that aside. Especially when it comes to the context of within the church and within the culture within the community christians that's that there's an incompatibility with with the desire for favoritism for us as believers and uh, to the contrary of that i was also reminded of another occasion in my life when i when i was guilty of judging by the face we were living in texas we had moved out of pittsburgh and we had a beautiful dog and we wanted to breed our beautiful lab with another beautiful lab to have beautiful lab babies. It's just something that we had a desire to do. And so I went to, the, to our vet and I said, do you see how beautiful my lab is? Surely you know of someone who has a, a beautiful female lab and they can have beautiful lab babies. That would be a, an awesome thing to do. And he gave me a phone number of someone's dog that, they, that he also took care of and knew and and uh, he said, call these people. I think that something could work out. So I did. And I called them. I called Mike and Cindy Curran. And, um, and so I told them about my beautiful dog and how his grandpa was on the bag of Iams dog food. And his pedigree was a champion bloodline all the way through. And they assured me that their sweet little baby girl was the same and it would make beautiful puppies. So I gathered my beautiful dog, uh, Dallas, up into the car and headed over to Mike and Cindy Curran's to find myself, to find myself in a trailer park home community with dirt roads, and it had been raining, so it was muddy, so I'm getting mud all over my car, and I'm thinking, I must have the wrong address. I know how much I had to pay for my dog. I just don't, I don't know, I mean, I mean I, and when I say a there, I'm sure there are really glorious trailer park home communities that are beautiful, but this one wasn't one of those. 
So I'm driving through there, and I'm finding myself making judgments. And I found the address, and sure enough, they, that Mike and Cindy were there. And, and, um, and so I went in. And I had trepidation of even wanting to leave my dog there. So, I didn't know how to kind of back out of it. So being the spiritual giant that I was, I got in my car and I pretended like I drove away, but I actually drove down the street, kind of come back, drove back a little bit, and I parked over on the side and I waited and I just watched. Started having all kinds of crazy thoughts going through my head, like maybe this is some kind of a, or like a dog scheme rig where they steal people's beautiful dogs and sell them on the market because this is impossible. How could this, there's some, it's not meshing. My expectations of what I was going to find with a family that had a beautiful dog for breeding was not this. And then I became fearful of my own dog and losing him and some crazy, the mind went bizarre, all based on how things were to the appearance. I sat there for probably about 30 minutes and finally decided, okay, you either got to go back and get your dog or you got to leave. So what do you think I did? I left. I, I left. I was like, I, I, I've just got to, I've got to go with this. So I left and I went straight, I'm not kidding, I went straight to the car wash and I had to wash my car. I had two inches of mud, coat, uh, it, was, it was crazy. And... They had beautiful puppies. And then, before I knew it, Mike and Cindy Curran, I became friends with Mike and Cindy Curran. And I shared the gospel with Mike and Cindy Curran. And Mike and Cindy Curran came to our church. But I was so concerned about things like this, I actually met with the elders and even talked to several people within the church, and I told them, Mike and Cindy are coming to our church on this day, and they look right. He has a ponytail that goes all the way down his back, and it's thick, and he's got these massive-looking gnarly tattoos, man. I mean, they're like, tough as nails. I mean, they're coming. Just don't be surprised. And they told me, Mike and Cindy said, we were, we were concerned about coming. We're wondering, how, you know, will we be accepted? And they openly talked about that. Would we be accepted, or would we be shown this kind of non-partial behavior, treatment? Would we be asked to kind of take the seat to the side? They came, the people loved on them, they stayed for potluck that Sunday, it just happened to be a potluck Sunday, they stayed and they got loved on by so many people, they kept coming back. Imagine that. But the story is to let you know that that is within our flesh in both directions and that is completely incompatible with Christianity. And I found myself dealing with that issue in that, on that one occasion. And that's not the only one occasion that I could tell you about in my life. Okay, and I'm not going to stand here and pretend like this is easy and that I'm perfect at this because it's not. But the standard that James is laying down for us is the standard. And to show partiality indicates that we have evil motives within our flesh that need to be put to death. Amen? Amen. That's what we have to do. And in the culture and the climate in which we are currently living, there are a lot of movements out there, like Black Lives Matter movements, right? And as conservatives, if you're a conservative, we can get angry about these Black Lives Matter movement and just be angry at people in general. And I have felt the tension within my breast to perhaps experience that. We have to be those who look at people through a biblical worldview. When I see movements like that in the culture, my mind immediately goes to the thought people need the Lord. Unsaved people, why, why should I be surprised that unsaved people tend to be radical, tend to be left-leaning, liberal in their morality, and even race-baiting, if you will? Why should I be surprised? Because that's what the father of lies is trying to do with every single human being on planet Earth, is to steal, kill, and destroy. Everyone. And James is going to show us in here 
that God, God shows favoritism. God shows mercy to poor people. God shows mercy to people of likes that we might would prefer not to show mercy to. And so if we're going to be God-like in the way that we conduct our Christianity, we must be those who are putting aside what remains of wickedness and filthiness because it comes from a place, as James says, I didn't say it, verse 4, evil motives. Well, I did say it, but I'm only saying what James said. I, so that's, all, that's all I'm saying. It's a bad place to be. We need to root these things out. Amen, brothers and sisters? So in verse 5, he says, listen. Now, have you ever heard Charles Stanley preach? And he says, now nah, listen to me, right? He's got something really important he's trying to say. Now nah, listen to me. That's, right. listen up. That's what James is doing right here. This is, Charles Stanley didn't originate that. James did, right? Now nah, listen to me, my beloved brethren. He says in verse 5, Did not God choose the poor of the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Again, the only possible answer is yes. This is what God did. God did choose poor of the world to be rich in faith. So again, in doing this, James is showing the incompatibility of favoritism within the church in that. Now listen, this is, this is so good. In that it completely contradicts God's attitude to, toward the poor of this world, many of whom, James here articulates, are the recipients of God's gracious election unto salvation. That's the way God has treated the poor. God chose many poor of the world to be rich in faith. James assumes that this congregation would be well acquainted with the poor of the world, seeing that all of them had recently just been, again, dispersed into a land not their own home, of, not their, of not their own. They've lost their homes. They've probably become day laborers of some sort just to keep food on their table. Their own conversion should be a powerful testimony to the deep regard that God has for the poor of the world. And as we see here, God's gracious free gift of salvation has in turn made these poor people what? Rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom of God, which he promised to those who love him. Isn't that beautiful? James has a way of just condensing things down into their simplest parts, doesn't he? He, he really does. Douglas Moo says this regarding verse 5. He says, Christians, however poor in material possessions they may be, possess spiritual wealth presently and anticipate greater blessings in the future. It is from this spiritual vantage point, not the material, that Christians should judge others. Whether believers or unbelievers, people should not be evaluated by Christians according to the standards of the world. Isn't that good? That is really good. I wish I would have said that myself. I wish, you know, in my pride, I wish I could go like this and just say, Ben Averett. <laughs> I'm not the only prideful one here, trust me. But that is really good. That, that, that will preach right there. If you want me to text that one to you later, just shoot me a text and I'll shoot that one to you. That's really good. And in verse 6, this is where we know that James isn't just talking theoretically about these things. He's not just kind of spitballing here. He says in verse 6, but you have. This is something you have done. You have dishonored the poor man. It's not theoretical. God has chosen many a poor person unto salvation, yet you have chosen to dishonor the poor because they seem to offer you no temporal value within your church community. Now, again, this does not mean that every poor person will be saved or that every rich person will be lost. That's in, indeed not what 
James is talking about. The main focus here is that these brothers and sisters within the church need to stop judging people, whether rich or poor. That's the illustration he used. We could give other distinctions there, but in this case, whether rich or poor, according to worldly standards. And instead, learn to see and rightly judge all people with a biblical worldview perspective. In other words, see and judge them the way God sees and judges them. If unbelievers, as those needing the Lord, as those needing the gospel, we preach the gospel, we plant and we water, and we just let God determine the growth. If they're believers, as those who possess every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, this is how we view people, and those believers are also in the process of being conformed more into the image of Jesus. They're not perfect. So when they sin, and they will... We don't shoot our own. We don't shoot our wounded. We don't throw them under the bus to be, and then back up over them after we've already run them over once. We encourage people all the more as we know the day of Christ is drawing near. That's what we do. Worldly evaluations are completely meaningless and only cause us to think and oftentimes act as judges, as James said at the end of verse 4, with evil motives. John MacArthur said it like this. He says, James has pointedly addressed the issue of partiality with the intent of rooting it from the soil of the Christian church. It should have no place in our fellowship. We are to be a biblical community that values what God values in a person. So I started off by saying there's nothing new under the sun. And here some 2,000 years after the writing of the book of James... People everywhere are still struggling with the issue of partiality. Call it partiality, call it personal favoritism, call it some form of culturalism or racism or whatever you want to call it. People are still struggling with this thing, and it's in the flesh. And James is saying that it must be rooted out from the soil of the Christian church. If two individuals come into your body on, an, on, an, on the Lord's Day, into your assembly... One dress like this, one dress like this, we should love on them equally and offer them the same greeting in the Lord every single time. Amen? So, very simple, very straightforward realities that James is talking about. And in, in order to kind of just highlight the absurdity of, of this, of what James is talking about here, he uses a, a, a series of three more questions through the rest of chapter six and seven, to highlight that very thing. And he starts right here by saying, is it not the rich who oppress you? And every one of these questions through this section here is intended to be answered with the affirmative, yes. So, is it not the rich who oppress you? He's writing to believers who were oppressed at coming to faith in Jesus Christ. They were being arrested drug into, into jail, told not to speak anymore about the name of Jesus. And then the persecution got so bad, there were many who went into the diaspora. So is it not the rich who oppress you? And the answer is affirmative. Yes, that's true. And is it not the rich who personally drag you into court? Aren't they the ones that have advantage over you and could use their resources? And even if they had to go to the courts to get, a, to get an, an, an affirmation on the very thing that they're trying to prevent you from doing or to be or to become? Aren't, aren't, isn't it the rich who are doing that? Just by way of, contra, uh, of distinctions here between the rich and the poor, aren't they the ones that do this? And then verse 7, as if it's not the worst, and do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? Again, in the affirmation, yes, it is. Blaspheme here is, is defined as to speak against someone in such a way as to harm or injure his or her reputation. And so they're blaspheming the fair name, and that fair name there would be none other than the fair name of Jesus Christ by which you have been called into fellowship with him. Was it not the rich who have done these things? Yes. And done this? Yes. And aren't they the ones that blaspheme the fair name of Jesus? Yes. So the irony of it all. But yet whenever the rich man comes into your assembly, you're wanting to show him personal favoritism, assuming that now all of a sudden he's going to have a change of opinion and start showing you favoritism. 
The irony of all this. Which, I've said before, sin is what? Temporary insanity. Thinking something that is completely not true. But by thinking that it's true, temporarily being insane for a moment, you do it anyways. It's almost like James is, is highlighting and, in, and indicating that very reality right here. These are the people who do you the most harm, but yet you want to show them personal favoritism when they come into your church? What's, what, are, you, are we all together here? James is just simply saying it doesn't make any sense. Partiality, as we've seen so far, it contradicts God's regard for the poor. And as I just mentioned, it just doesn't make any sense. I couldn't come up with anything really catchy on that one. I was like, I really tried. I did. But I was just thinking about it. I was like, yeah, I think James is just saying it doesn't make any sense. So I just put it doesn't make any sense because I think that's what he's saying. And then next week when we get to verses 8 through 13, he's going to articulate how it violates the law of love, the law of liberty, the law of life in Christ Jesus that sets us free from the law of sin and death. It violates that. And thus we become transgressors of the law. And James is going to show the, the severity of partiality. He's going to even compare it against adultery and murder. He's going to throw it into those categories. Because sometimes we're prone, and I'm, I guess I'm tipping my hand a little bit for next week, but sometimes aren't we prone to say, well, but I, I mean, I don't, I don't commit adultery. I haven't murdered anyone. Did you sing King David? I'm not that bad. All I do is show a little partiality. And James is blasting that kind of a concept completely out of the water and saying there's absolutely no room in the soil of Christian community for personal favoritism, for, for racism, by judging people by the face, facial appearance, clothing appearance, the kind of car you see them drive in or out with, etc., etc., etc. There's no room for that whatsoever if you're going to be claiming to hold to faith in the glorious one. Because the law of liberty of life in Christ Jesus has done what? It has set you free from that law of sin and death which wages war within your flesh. We're going to get there next week. And then James uses this as the context to move into chapter 2 and following where he talks about dead faith. That faith, being alone, by itself, it's dead. Oh, we can't wait to get there, can we? That's a right old passage that has turned many a people asunder. But this is the context in which he's leading us into that very context. So church, my admonition is to continue being the loving body that I've seen you be here for the past two and a half years. But not only be that here, because your Christianity doesn't end when, or just begin when you walk in and, and, and end as you leave. You have within you the hope of glory, the light of the world abiding within you, and the promise of the Holy Spirit dwells with you. Be, a, uh, be an, an, a change agent for good within the community in the way you speak and so act as those who live by the law of liberty. Amen? Amen. That's what we are called to do. It's not easy, but we can do it with the help of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray.